within 16 years of those Muslims who made the first hijrah of Islam, what was the result of their good behavior? And what was the result of their contribution to that society? Subhanallah, the king of that country, Najashi, Najashi, he became a Muslim. And that king who became a Muslim, six of his ministers, through his invitation, secretly, they became Muslim. See, subhanallah. Subhanallah. So even the king of a country, whether the queen of England or the king of your country and the ministers of that country, if you had good behavior, if we established institutions, if we did business with them, if we did agriculture and farming and we purchased land and they can see the contribution that we are making to the society, after some time, the, the vomit, the vomit of the haters would be forgotten. The vomit of people like Gert Wilders in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands, his vomit will be forgotten. The enemies of Islam, they will be forgotten. And your colleagues and your co-workers, your neighbors who are non-Muslims, they will remember what you have done, what you have contributed. And many of them, like the Najashi, they will become Muslims through our example and through our interaction. This is one of the major challenges of the Muslims in the modern world. إن الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن ولا وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ذلالة في النار أيها الأخوة الكرام وأخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to travel throughout the earth and to meet with Muslims to widen our vision uh, to offer our nasiha and uh, when the opportunity arises to be able to remove misconceptions and distortions about Islam and Muslims. We thank and we commend the young men and women uh, of the uh, Islam Net Organization uh, for putting together this uh, kind of a conference. Um, <clears throat> I have been here uh, twice before and I'm very um, thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be invited again. My discussion today is about the challenge of Muslims living in the modern society. What I have to say, many, much of it, is based upon my own experience. Traveling through 75 countries, now 313 cities around the world, And especially my experience traveling through the Muslim countries. And the experience traveling through the non-Muslim countries where Muslims live as minorities 
as in my own country, the United States of America. It is unfortunate that while we Muslims who live as minorities in the non-Muslim countries, where we have accessible to us unbelievable technological, material, intellectual resources, we don't use it. We use, we are the consumers of technological equipment and software. We use it. And while we use it, we are being used. The average Muslim doesn't understand that every time you use Google, giggle or gaggle, whatever you're using, every time you use it, they are capturing your information, packaging your information, and selling that to transnational corporations to make money. But you think that you're using it for free. You're being used for free. It is unfortunate that while Muslims have spent the last 30 years in the Western world, 30 years where most of you young people were not even born. Your fathers and your uncles, they were here. Your aunties, your mothers, they were here. And from that time, 30 years ago until now, we haven't built any institutions except a masjid a madrasa, or a duxi. Restaurants do not count as institutions. Muslims have, in, wherever you go, Muslims have madrasas, duxis, masjids, Islamic centers, and restaurants. The hospitals, the schools, the municipal organizations, the resource organizations, the financial institutions that we use every day, that we depend upon every day, that we send our children to every day, that we graduate from every day, they belong to the non-Muslims. And you ask yourself, why? And I have asked that question. Well, a lot of the Muslims, they say, this is not our country. And we're not interested in building nothing up in the Kafir country. That is very sad. That is a very sad response. The first Muhajireen, who went to Habash under the leadership of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. They made hijrah, the first hijrah of Islam. They made hijrah to a non-Muslim country. Non-Muslims, Kafirs, But because of their good behavior, and because they were farmers engaged in agriculture, and because they were business people engaged in tijara, and because they had good manners, good behavior, and they interacted with the people, you see what happened. The king of that country, whom the Prophet wasallam said, that he is a just ruler. See, he's a non-Muslim, but the Prophet said he is a just ruler. 
Of course, our Prophet وسلم, didn't meet him. He didn't meet him. This come to him through Wahi. So he sent his followers to a Christian country like yours. I don't know if the king here is a just ruler or not, but they have democracy and open society. He sent his followers to a Christian country, a non-Muslim country, where he was inspired that this person was a just ruler. He will receive them with decency and dignity. And you, Muslims, from 40, 50 years ago, you were received with decency and dignity. But see the difference. Many of those Muslims stayed in that country up until the Hijrah to Medina Munawwara, to Yathrib. And some of them even stayed after that and made their Hijrah later. Within 16 years of those Muslims who made the first hijra of Islam, what was the result of their good behavior? And what was the result of their contribution to that society? Subhanallah, the king of that country, Najashi, Najashi, he became a Muslim. And that king who became a Muslim, six of his ministers, through his invitation, secretly, they became Muslim. See, subhanallah. Subhanallah. So even the king of a country, whether the queen of England or the king of your country and the ministers of that country, if you had good behavior, if we established institutions, if we did business with them, if we did agriculture and farming and we purchased land and they can see the contribution that we are making to the society, after some time, the, the vomit, the vomit of the haters would be forgotten. The vomit of people like Gert Wilders in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands, his vomit will be forgotten. The enemies of Islam, they will be forgotten. And your colleagues and your co-workers, your neighbors who are non-Muslims, they will remember what you have done, what you have contributed. And many of them, like the Najashi, they will become Muslims through our example and through our interaction. This is one of the major challenges of the Muslims in the modern world. Now, I understand that I have my own opinions. And alhamdulillah, in a free country like we live, we can have our own opinions. And in a free country where I live, we have our own opinions. We can speak about the government. If we don't like the president, we can say, I don't like the president. I don't agree with what he says. Unfortunately, we cannot do that in the Muslim world. If I was in a Muslim country now talking, giving my own opinions about the society, about the government, how we should improve the government, subhanAllah, within 10, 15 minutes, they would lock me up, and because you're sitting there, they'd lock all of us up too. So we should be grateful to be in a place where we can express ourselves, where we can have a passport that we can move around the world at will where we can purchase land and we can develop and we can change the country. We can reform ourselves. We can reform our, our families. We can reform our neighborhoods. We can reform the society. And we would have the right to write and speak and act and gather and organize with the aim of reforming the society not conquering the society as some immature Muslims they talk about. Some immature Muslims. 
at night they talk and in the clubs they talk and in small groups they talk about conquering the society. They just drinking Kool-Aid. They just smoking hubbly bubbly. They just dreaming and talking calamal folly. They're not going to establish anything because they can't get up in the morning and establish the Fajr prayer in Jama'ah. We don't need to conquer the society. Islam is not that kind of a religion. You're reading the same Quran, you're quoting the same Sunnah, but the results are coming to you differently because of the irregularities inside of yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, A'udhu billahi samin ali min ash-shaitan rajim, wa ahsinu inna allaha yuhibbul muhsinin. For us to kind of understand this ayah in a different context than from just what it means in the language translation. Some people translate it to say, and do good, verily Allah, he loves those who do good. But let us take it within the context of the society. You know, in the, in the, uh, the Jum'ah prayer, every Friday, and some of you, you might miss it because, you know, now today, some of the Muslims... They come to the Jummah prayer just a couple of minutes before the Imam pray. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you want to do the Jummah prayer. You want to be able to say that I prayed. So you, you purposely come to the Jummah prayer about three or four minutes before the Imam or the Khatib prays. So you can jump inside the ranks and you can wave and you can bow up and down, taslim out, and then go. Because you don't realize it, that Jumu'ah is a clinic. Jumu'ah is a spiritual clinic. And when you miss Jumu'ah, you miss that clinic. And you are like a person who is on dialysis. And how many people that are on dialysis to clean their kidneys and their blood, if you were to miss three of those dialysis, you will die. And those of you who purposely come to the Jum'ah prayer just to pray and you don't hear the medicine, you don't get your dose that week. Why? Because you're reading the Quran and you're talking the Sunnah, but you're not getting the same results because of the irregularities inside your mind and your heart. So usually in most masajids, there is a central ayah that the khatib he's going to say, at least maybe for the last eight, nine hundred years around the world, I hear wherever I go, just before he goes up on the member, I mean, just before he, he uh, goes to the prayer, he says, Inna Allaha ya'muru bil adr. Wal ihsan. Wa ita'idhul qurba. He says that. But unfortunately, the reaction of the Muslims is different. They think when they hear that ayah, he's about to pray. So they start shifting. They start shifting and getting ready to stand up. They're not really listening to the ayah. Because if you listen to the ayah and you ponder on the ayah, you will see what the meaning and what the implication is. The ayah says, Verily Allah, inna Allah ya'muru. Verily Allah has commanded you upon justice. What kind of justice? Brothers, justice for your wives. Sisters, justice for your husband and your children. Justice towards your neighbors. Justice in the society. Allah commanded us upon justice in all circumstances and conditions. What kind of justice? Justice in the society. Adal. Wal ihsan. Two things Allah commanded us in this ayah. Adal. Wal ihsan. So what is ihsan? It is goodness. As the ayah said, Wa ahsinu in Allah yuhabbul muhsinin. But what kind of goodness? It is the goodness where Muslims contribute to the society. 
It is the goodness where Muslims, they relieve the pain and the suffering. It is the goodness where Muslims become philanthropic. It is the goodness where Muslims become entrepreneurs. It is the goodness where Muslims are benevolent. It is the goodness where Muslims set up endowments. It is the goodness where Muslims, they create resources in the society. So what kind of goodness we have brought to this society? And that you fulfill the rights towards those who are near to you. And that you stay away from all kinds of crime and corruption and filthy things. And see, the non-Muslims, they don't have to exaggerate. The non-Muslims, they don't have to hate and say bad things. They don't have to call us terrorists and fanatic and extremists and all those filthy things that they say as a cover-up for their own corruption. But one of the things that the non-Muslims can say which is truthful is how some of the young people represent Islam in the streets. SubhanAllah. I just come from, uh, from Copenhagen. And there's some Muslims who, who got their own gangs like dogs they're just they're just young muslim dogs oh they pray sometimes oh they wear kufi they wear kufaya they wear this they wear that they talk a lot of talk a lot of things but what are they doing they're robbing people and they're calling it ghanima subhanallah robbing people breaking in people's homes Stopping people in the cars in the middle of the day, pulling them out the cars, robbing them, hijacking the cars. Allahu Akbar, they saying. They representing me? No, they're not representing me. They're the wild dogs of the Muslims. They need to be shot or contained as they're being done, you understand me, down in Brazil. If you would go down in Brazil, they got some young wild dogs in the street. But when the police catch them, they don't even take them to jail. They just shoot them in the street like wild dogs, put them in bags and throw them on top of a truck. We don't want that for our Muslim brothers, but we also don't want what kind of image that they are creating for Islam. Can you imagine that? And if you have something to say to them, brother, stop, what are you doing? If I was talking to them in the street like I am now, they would kill me. They would kill their fathers or their uncles or anybody else who stands in their way because they are jahil, ignorant, corrupt, evil. And somehow or another, the leaders of the Muslims in the masjids, they don't say nothing. And you know, silence is consent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatan ukhrijat lin nas. The first responsibility of the leaders of the Muslims, the, the Umara, the leaders of the Muslims, the A'immatul Muslimin, the first responsibility of them, it is to establish the prayer. It is to teach the people uh, about Islam, whether the ahkam of it or the fiqh of it. It is to teach the people that and lift them up and give them the consciousness. But it is also their job to be in the front line of, in, of commanding what is right and forbidding what is wrong, even if it's against their own children and even if it costs them their own lives. But where are they? SubhanAllah. I go to lectures like this here at least two, three times a month. And I look for the old guys with the, with the, uh, with the gray beards. I look for them. And guess what? We don't find many of them. We have one Sheikh Haddad with us. And he's always with us. May Allah reward you for that Sheikh. Those frontline shuyukh who's willing to be with the young people and sacrifice himself and his sleep and his time and his body and his family. May Allah reward the shuyukh like that. And may Allah reward all of them and forgive them. We're just talking about our responsibility. So we Muslims, we have to look and see and ask and be honest with ourselves. What are we contributing to the society? Because this is one of our major challenges. In a world of cynicism and mutual condemnations, 
It is extremely difficult to convince people of the basic goodness of human beings. In a world where most everyone have been harmed, insulted, and transgressed upon, it is very rare to find people willing to forgive. In a world of bigotry, racism, and class struggle, human beings have justified why they do not have to sit and why they do not have to listen to whomever they consider to be their inferiors or their oppositions. This is happening among the Muslims. We have no tolerance for each other. For me, I say, I believe in my heart to the best of my ability. I believe I have love and attachment to the Salaf al-Saleh. Radiallahu anhum. I believe that. That is my conviction. That's what I'm struggling for. To stay upon that to the best of my ability within my capacity. But you know, some young brothers, they will say, Oh, the sheikh, he ain't that. He don't even call himself Salafi. He's a Muqtadi. He's a Qutubi. He's a Ash'ari. He's a this and he's a that. And they spend their times at night on hiding behind computer screens, using Facebook, sending missiles out, slandering the leaders of the Muslims, slandering the lecturers, slandering the du'at, and calling to themselves, Kullu hizbun bima ladayhi farihun. They all think they are the ones. May Allah forgive them. May Allah give them something better to spend their time for. But I would like to just tell the young brothers and the young sisters, if you spend two or three hours at night hiding behind a screen talking about the issues of the world and the Muslims, you're just a coward. Because real men and real women and real Muslims, they speak directly to whom they differ with and they address problems directly. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu taqullah wa qulu qawlan sadida yuslih lakum. Then Allah, he will straighten our hearts and straighten our affairs. Yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa man yuti Allah wa rasuluhu faqad, faqad, faza fawzan azima. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he guided us. In a world of bigotry, racism and class struggle, human beings have justified why they do not have to sit and listen to whom they consider their inferiors or the opposition. And in a world of frustration and anger and great misunderstandings, it is extremely difficult to bridge differences and to accept arbitration. That's our job. When we have differences, Allah told us, Fas'alu ahl dhikr The ahl dhikr is the ulama and the fuqaha. We call them, and we sit down, and we listen to them. And we accept what is called binding arbitration. This is something you need to know. When we seek arbitration in Islam, it is binding obligation. You can't seek obligation and then leave from the arbitration and say, Yeah, Jazakumullah khairin shaykhuna, may Allah bless you for that, but I still got my own idea. No. Muslims, we don't do that. Not real Muslims. This is our world, and this is our society, and this is our individual and collective dilemma. In the midst of all of this darkness and pessimism, there's the need for a great inspiration and a powerful moral vision. A moral vision. A vision that everybody can latch on to. You know, there was a lady, a Christian lady. Her name was Mother Teresa. You heard her name? Do you hear her name? She received the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. There was a man called Martin Luther King. You heard his name? Yeah, he received the, uh, the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. I use these two people. They're Christians, huh? They use the platform of their religion to, uh, to do good, what they call, and call people and call out for a moral vision. And the world, the entire world, of intellectuals and leaders, they respected them and they conferred upon them something called a peace prize. 
because they had a moral vision, a moral vision that is still alive today. It is not like the Islamic moral vision. You know, the Prophet wasalam, he didn't need any peace prize. He had a legacy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسْنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَّكُرُ اللَّهُ كَثِيرًا That's his legacy. That from that time until now, any prizes that's being given out is in the light of that legacy. Because he was the paradigm par excellence. So therefore, we have more right to that moral vision than Mother Teresa. And we have more right to that moral vision than Martin Luther King. Just as the Prophet Sallallahu said, we have more right to practice, observe Ashura than the Jewish people that came before him. O oh, Muslims, but where will humanity obtain such a vision? Persons of various philosophies and religions will claim they have the answer. But we cannot all be right. But we also cannot be all entirely wrong. I want to put forward a moral proposition that is based upon and inscribed in divine scripture, Al-Quran. Now, brothers and sisters, I delivered this lecture uh, the year that, uh, about three months after Mr. Obama. You know him, right? About three months after Mr. Obama uh, became the president of the United States, the black man in the White House. You know him, right? And during that time, Muslims were kind of like thinking, what should we do and how should we, you know, and uh, what sign does this mean to us? And, you know, does, is this something good for us? And should we vote for him? And they were going through this kind of whatever. And so it becomes necessary for the du'at, even the small ones, you know. It becomes necessary for the students, you know, even the students of the students of the students, the small ones. It becomes necessary for those who stand in front of the people to come up with solutions and propositions. So this is what I wrote. And where the name America would come up if I was talking in America, I'm going to switch it to say Europe or your country. The writers of the American Constitution, and I'm sure the writers of the Constitution of your country, they shared the same scriptural sensitivity because originally this country was, uh, was, uh, uh, this country was founded by people who uh, subscribed to one or two parts of Christianity, Catholicism or Protestantism. And although since it was subscribed, the country has demised in which people with a materialistic agenda, they have sort of gained leverage. So a great deal of the people now are they are either atheist or they are agnostic. This means that spirituality, it has eroded. But those writers of that constitution shared the same scriptural sensitivity. But they left it up to every citizen to pursue that moral truth based upon their own perceptions, as it is left to up, up to us to pursue that moral truth up to our moral perceptions. This is what makes your country unique. This is what makes North America unique. This is what makes Europe in the world unique. Their uniqueness and what they're presently in their present structure does not absolve them of the, crim of the crimes that they have committed in order to have the resources that they have. Let's make that clear. The Dutch and the Germans, the Americans and the French and the British and the Portuguese committed unmentionable crimes. The plundering, the slaughtering, the entering of people's homes and lands and snatching out their resources and enslaving them. This is what they did in the name of God. But you know, 200 years later, 300 years later, they wear pinstripe suits and they sit in their parliaments and they talk about democracy because they have become smooth criminals. 
but let's be fair and let's go back to the history and see how things developed. This issue of liberty, personal, private, industrial, liberty, this is what makes Europe and America unique. That the individual has rights that cannot be encroached upon by the government. You know, the Europeans and I'm in my country, they have so much individual rights that they have went to the far right or the far left with their rights. Where Allah tells us, yes, the individual has rights, but also the leadership have rights, the government have rights. And uh, the individual cannot follow their rights or pursue their rights in subversion of the government. And the government cannot pursue, you understand me, their interests in subversion of the personal rights. This is what Islam has given to us. But unfortunately, in the Western world, in the modern world, they have given the individuals, whether individual businessmen or industrial people or, or individuals in their own uh, particular rights or ideas, they have given them so much rights that they can now subvert the interests of the society. This is what makes your country and my country unique from every other place in the world and why people from all over the world, they are drawn to go to America. Because, you know, Hollywood and Disneyland gives people the idea that there's a yellow brick road to the paradise until they get there. It is the principle that toleration and mutual respect will give to every human being the opportunity to secure their basic human liberty, yet provide the privilege for everyone to promote their own religious convictions. We have been witnessing such a movement throughout the Muslim world just to secure these basic freedoms. And subhanAllah, you see, after what the Muslims went through in Egypt, after they, what they went through in Egypt, after 40 years of oppression, the Muslims finally removed a dhalim. They removed him. But as soon as they removed him, see what the condition is now. Now they're talking about rising up and overthrowing a new president. See how the Muslims are? Now they're saying that President Mursi, that he is now worse than Mubarak. <laughs> Subhanallah. What the Muslims they want? What they want? They cannot accept rulership. They cannot accept to be led. They cannot appreciate the opportunity of unity. And Subhanallah, see what is happening in Tahrir Square. See what is happening there. Brothers are raping the sisters, subhanAllah, in the broad daylight, man. Brothers, Muslims, who is chanting flags and la ilaha illallah and everything. They are raping sisters in the open public of Tahrir Square. You need to read and see. How could this happen in a Muslim country like Egypt? where six out of 10 of the young Muslims who are 18, 19, 20 years old are, are university graduates. Can you believe that? That they are raping sisters in the open public? If you don't believe it, read. Read the journals from all over the world. It's not the, the Western journals. Read the journals and look at the news. Look at BBC, ABC, NBC, look at Al Jazeera, look, read, see what Muslims do. See what Muslims is doing against each other in Palestine. They talking about Al Yahud and this and that. See what Muslims do to each other. See what Muslims do to each other in Pakistan. See what Muslims do to each other in Afghanistan. See what Muslims do to each other in Iraq. See what Muslims do to each other in Libya. While the people were striving in Libya to overthrow the Dalim, see what they were doing to the Africans who was workers in their country. They were taking tires 
putting it on them and setting it on fire. For what reason? Only because they said they're taking our jobs. Subhanallah. They were forcing the Africans from other parts of Africa to live in garbage dumps in fear while they are out in the streets talking about liberation. See what Muslims do to each other. See what Muslims are doing to each other, have done to each other in Somalia. See what Muslims did. They overthrew, they undermined their own country because of tribalism. You understand? And so, the brother Somalis and sisters Somalis, don't be getting no attitude with me. I'm Somali. Let's go what on. So do other. At least I'm half Somali. My wife is Somali, so I think I got a right to talk to my family. But see what Muslims do to Muslims. And when non-Muslims see what Muslims do to Muslims, what do you think they will imagine they will do to non-Muslims? We have to be honest and we have to be fair. In a free and democratic society, this is how visions are born. And this is how they are cultivated. We must be grateful to have this privilege living in the country where we are. With that in mind, I want to point out a few things that may complement our role in European society, and in particular, here in Norway. When my president, and I have to say he's my president, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an American citizen. And I thank God to be an American citizen because it allows me to speak critically about my country and about criminals like Mr. Bush and Cheney, you know, the tag team, the criminal tag team. And I always say, thank God that Mr. Bush went back to the bushes. But that's because I know that when I go back home, the homeboys, they're going to meet me at the plane. You know the homeboys. Homeland Security. They don't wait for me to come downstairs with my baggage. They meet me at the plane. And they make an announcement. They tell everybody, please have your passports open to the picture page. And I know they're actually waiting for me. So I sit in my seat and I wait for everybody to get off the plane. So I'm the last one and I got my passport open to the picture page. I say, I'm the one you're waiting for, guys. <laughs> and I also say, hey, guys, look, you got the coffee and the donuts waiting downstairs? They said, Mr. Yassin, that's not what we do. OK, good. Take my bags. They said, Mr. Yassin, that's not what we do. I tell them, you need to do that. You wasting my time. And I'm a taxpayer, and I'm paying your salary. And you guys are asking me the same stupid 15 or 20 questions Every time, it's in the computer, man. Go back and read it. Nothing has changed. And I also remind them, you guys are late. If you're trying to catch me doing something, you are at least 50 years late. But I say, I understand. And you guys shouldn't be paranoid because, I mean, Obama, he did get Osama. But I say, in that case, you were also late. Because that wasn't the real Osama that you should have been worried about. The real Osama was Osama bin Zaid. Did you guys read about him? Well, there's some babies, some sons that's in the womb. And there are some Osamas that are five or six years old now. Those is the Osamas you need to be worried about, not the one you think you just got. He was a very small Osama. They laugh, and I laugh too. Mr. Obama, when he ran for the presidency, was on the platform of the need for change. The theme of his campaign was a need for change. Wow, isn't that powerful? And I knew he didn't come up with that by himself. He read the Quran. He knew the Quran said, 
Allah will not change the condition of a people until the people change the condition within them own self. So he took that out of the Quran and he boxed it up and he branded it. And that brought him into the White House. Because he knew that the most important thing for Americans to focus upon was a change in their thinking. When Mr. Obama won the election to that great office, he delivered his inaugural address and he specified the areas which needed the greatest concentration for change. He said, he said the economy, he said health care, he said environment, he said energy, he said crime and corruption, he said education, he said parity in, uh, 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 in, in sharing the resources, and he said also to become those that are only engage in just wars. Well, we have to understand that Mr. Obama himself, he was only speaking rhetorically. He knew he could not do much because he's only the president of the United States. But there's another group of people who are ruling the United Snakes. See, there's a group of people who are the United Snakes and they really have the greatest influence over the president of the United States. So since Mr. Obama understood that, he spoke rhetorically. But we Muslims, we should read into that because it is also our concern. It should be our concern about the economy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, O you who believe, consume only the good things which we have provided for you. And one of the ways that the economy is undermined is when it is undermined by the production and the distribution of haram products and services like riba. Muslims should be coming up with an alternative. When somebody keeps asking the question, Sheikh, what can we do if we got to live in a house and we don't have money? Can't we, you know, under those circumstances? I don't give any fatwa. I tell them, Fas'aluhu ahli dhikr. Go ask the people who themselves are the experts in that issue. Go ask the people who themselves are the scholars of your society. Go and ask the people to find solutions for you. It's not for me to tell you what you should do and what you should not do. Sheikh, what can we do? If I want to go to school, I want to get a graduate degree, but I don't have money, what can I do? It is the duty of the scholars and the thinkers among the Muslims to find the solution. And not simply to tell the people, haram, 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 haram. We know what the boundaries are, but they need to give us the tools. They need to give us the guidance to be creative and to be innovative outside of the religion to be innovative in the society, in the development of resources and the development of institutions, alternative ones that could take us away from the haram towards the halal. And after 30 years, we're still asking the same questions. Islam was a system dedicated to personal and social reform. Personal and social reform. Therefore, we have to enter the discussion about the economy. Some of you Muslims in the university, you need to take economics, whether macroeconomics, industrial economics, the ec uh, international economics, you need to take economics, get a degree in economics, so you can enter the field and the discussion. The Prophet said, take care of five before five. You know that hadith. And one of those is take care of your health before your illness. You take for granted the issue of health care because you live in a country where health care is reasonably guaranteed everybody. Is that correct? You're very fortunate. Suppose you were living in Egypt. You know, there's a joke. They say, don't get sick in Egypt. Do not go to the hospital in Egypt, because if you're not really sick, you're going to be sick. 
You know, it's a joke, but lots of times jokes are built upon reality. Do you know any Muslim country where health care is guaranteed everybody to any level that you need? Muslims should be grateful to be living in Europe because in my country, if you get sick and you don't have health care, you'll die in the street or you'll die in your home. You'll bleed while you're in the hospital and you'll die sitting right there. This is my sophisticated America. You Muslims in your country, you are reasonably guaranteed education up to a certain level. But in America, we're not guaranteed anything. You see, you take things for granted because it's right in front of you. But when you don't have it, you can appreciate it. He said the environment. And our Prophet Wasallam, he said, All human beings share in three things, fire, water, and grass. So what is fire? Fire is energy, whether fossil fuels or any other kind of energy that's taken out of the ground. Fire is energy. So that means all human beings share in energy, and no individual and no group and no family have the right to harness the energy for themselves and control it because they will definitely use it to exploit the rest of the people. And water and air is shared by all the human beings and all the animals on the planet. No industrial people have the right to throw smoke and filth into the air and, and filth into industrial waste, into the oceans and the rivers, in order for them to make their profits, to make their industrial profits, while they pollute the water and air sources of the human beings. And no human beings have a right to manipulate the agriculture. Because whoever manipulates the agriculture, this is a grave manner of exploitation of the human beings because we are all dependent upon the agriculture. Fire, water, and grass. Grass is agriculture. Nobody has the right to manipulate that. And this company called Monsanto that owns 89% of all the genetically modified organisms in the world, one company owns 89 to 90% of all the genetical, genetically modified organisms in the world. And you need to take a look do a little research, do a white paper on genetically modified foods. SubhanAllah, you will see. So our Prophet Wasallam, long time ago, Allah inspired him upon these things that Mr. Obama, he spoke about. And as for crime and corruption, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Muslims to be in the forefront of commanding what is right and preventing what is wrong. We are supposed to be in the forefront and not in the neighborhoods shooting each other and sponsoring crime and corruption in our neighborhoods. And as for education, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent so many ayats to us about education, including the first five ayats of the first revelation that he sent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reminded us, in fi khalq samawati wal ardi wa fi al layli wa nahar, this ayah. He told us to ponder, to reflect, to educate ourselves. He told us to read. He told us to write. He told us to research. He told us to reflect. He told us to meet with other people, build up resources so that knowledge would precede words and deeds. And as for war, the Americans and the Europeans have no right to counsel anybody about war. They are the warmongers. They are the most aggressive, subversive people when it comes to respecting the land, the rights, and the resources of other people. We can just go into the history of the Europeans for the last 200 years and what they have done to South America. 
and what they have done to Africa and what they have done to Asia with their colonialist ambitions. And they continued to do that until they had to stop. They only stopped when they had to. Otherwise, they would still be colonizing the world. And today, they're still trying to colonize, but they're being slick about it. They call it a new world order. So that the countries that they gave their freedom to are still living, most of them, on one dollar a day. Can you believe that? The countries that they have given freedom to, after they colonized them, exploited them, and left, they left people in place who themselves would continue to exploit the country on their behalf. And most of the countries that received their freedom from these European devils are living on one dollar a day. And there's a statistic I want to share with you that I share with uh, some of the European intellectuals who are so humane. You know, they're so humane. In Europe, the average person spends more on their dog and cat than the entire budget of the third world. Can you believe that? The people that own dogs and cats, they comb them, they groom them, they put nice suits on them. Dog food and cat food in Europe, if you took just what the budget is for dog and cat food in Europe, is greater than the budget of the third world. SubhanAllah, and they're being humane. And this is why they fear Islam. Because they know that if Islam comes, the real Islam comes, one of the objects of Islam is to remove the disparity of wealth so that the wealth does not reside in one place and stay in that one place, but that gradually that wealth is weaned away from the people who is holding it and it is, it is distributed among the people. And that his, Islam has a history. Islam has a history. And they are not referring to us, but they're going back to the first 300 years of Islam. And they saw what the 300 years of Islam, it did to the world. And they never want that to happen again. Dear brothers and sisters, our challenge is to integrate the principle of Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nahir al-Munkar. Our challenge is to be known as just people and benevolent people and highly moral people. We Muslims should become familiar with these issues. and We must use our faith and our insight to offer viable solutions and or propositions to the American people or the Western people or the people of Norway towards these very serious issues. We have been ordered in the Quran so many times, ittaqillah. He, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ittaqillah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Ittaqillah haythu ma kuntum. Watbi'a sayyya bil hasana tamhuha. Wa khaliq nas bi khuluqin hasanin. See, see how the Prophet Sallallahu spoke. We should strive to both understand and implement the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam within the context, within the context, within the context and framework of the Constitution and the society. We should develop a thinking and a commitment to Islamic community, not Muslim ethnic, not Muslim ethnic culturally driven communities. We should make a commitment to Islamic community, Islamic leadership, and the development of all the skills and products and services that will empower us and complement the society. We should strongly urge, in fact, we should insist upon our respected leaders to collaborate with each other, to cooperate with each other, and to galvanize the Muslim community in order to address not only their particular issues, 
but the critical issues of the society. We can no longer accept or support religious ritualism and traditions that distance us and isolate us from the mainstream society. We have to be involved, caring, empathizing, and contributing to the welfare of the greater society. We must engage in open dialogue, interfaith discussions, forums, and projects that will allow the Islamic values to be exemplified. We should remember that we are not simply a faith-based community, rather we are a community with a clear mandate to establish the faith in our society. We should feel the overwhelming compulsion to preach, teach our faith, inviting with clarity, confidence, and wisdom every human being, regardless of their social status. We must believe in the excellence of Islam and its historical capacity to engage, to compete, and to prevail in any environment, at any time, and under any circumstances. We must develop and sustain the belief and the certainty that the Islamic system is the very best solution for the entire world and also for this society where we live in. And we Muslims must be prepared to put forward the proposition and point to a very clear and irrefutable evidence for what we are saying. Allah will hold us accountable for all the privileges and opportunities that we have been given as Muslims in a modern world. And he will ask us on the day of judgment, what contribution have you made as a sign of your gratitude for the people that gave you something? When Muslims show their genuine concern, when Muslims are grateful, when Muslims put their hands out to work and not put their hands out to beg. When Muslims put their hands out to work and contribute, other Europeans, other Norwegians, in my case, other Americans, they will take notice. When Muslims commit themselves to launch a social reform movement, as our Prophet ﷺ belonged to Hilf al-Fudul, a social reform movement, when we Muslims launch a social reform movement with our faith in this country, others will listen and some will respond and then we can put forward some of the moral propositions and principles that can save our country. I truly believe that we Muslims are holding the keys to stabilizing this country and other countries that we live in. But we can only use those keys when and if we can think outside the box of our personal desires. When we can think outside the box of our personal cultures and ethnicity. When we can think outside the box of our neighborhood. And even think outside the box of your society to think about the world. This is the development of a world global view. No doubt. There will be some very strong criticisms coming from various circles of the self-righteous Muslims and some of their leadership. They will say, you know, the Sheikh, he sell I he sound like he's selling out. That's what they're gonna call me. He's a sellout. No, I want to correct them. I'm buying in. That's different. I'm buying into the society where I live. I'm buying into the world where I live. I'm buying in with the resources that Allah has given to me. I'm buying in with the vision that Islam has given me. And when I buy in, that means I contribute. And if I contribute, that means I participate. And if I participate, I have the chance to win. And those that isolate themselves, they are the sellouts. I sincerely believe that we Muslims in America, and in particular our religious leadership, the business community, the professionals and the intellectuals, must understand the history of their country. You must understand the history of Norway and the European Union. I must understand the history 
of North America. Other Muslims must understand the history of Australia. And those Muslims who live in these areas that are dominating the world, when we understand their history and their constitution, and we buy in with our faith and our guidance, we can change our societies, and eventually we have the chance to change the world. I believe that we have to be committed to preserving our constitutional freedoms and collaborating with other citizens in the country to defend our country. And even some Muslims will say, what are you talking about, Sheikh? How are we going to defend the country? When the Najashi asked Jafar ibn Abi Talib, what would he do if his country was attacked from some people from the outside? Jafar ibn Abi Talib told him, we would be obligated to defend it. SubhanAllah. Why are we different Muslims? I believe that we have to be committed. And of course, that statement should be placed within the context of good advice, consultation, thinking, involvement, understanding. It is not a statement that is made in some kind of a vacuum. I believe that we have to be committed to preserving our constitutional freedoms that are given to us and others and collaborating with other Europeans to defend the values of Europe and the values of the Muslims who live in Europe from the immoralities of people who themselves have their own godless agenda, including the drug sellers, the homosexuals, they have their own agenda. And we should not be in the streets uh, uh, arguing against them and blaming them and calling them bad names and all of that. No, we should do what they are doing. We should be contributing to the society. We should be promoting our agenda. We should be pointing out why their behavior is wrong, why their behavior is subversive. Why the behavior, you know, is uh, subversive to the welfare and the health of the human beings. We should point it out from a clinical point of view. We should point it out from an intellectual point of view. We should point it out from a social point of view. And finally, we should point it out from a moral point of view because that's our job. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Muslims will wake up and smell the coffee that they will appreciate the freedoms that they have and that they will use the liberties and resources that Allah has given to them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this generation that's in front of us, that they will receive good advice and they will think about themselves and think about their mothers and their daughters and their sisters and their wives and they will think about their social responsibility and they will think about their social responsibility in the society that has given them so much and they will want to change themselves and change their families and also eventually change the society. And I think that these culminate into the major challenges facing the Muslims in the modern world. We say, Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik wa nashadu wa na ilaha illa ant wa nastaghfiruku wa natubu alayk. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is an uprising movement in Norway only speaking about jihad and killing all the kuffar and what they consider murtadin. Are these people just ignorant? They're, ig they're ignorant. They're just ignorant. The brothers are not able to kill their own nafs, but they want to go out and kill kuffar. The brothers can't take care of their families. The brothers are disrespecting the sisters. The brothers are not giving nafqa to their wives. The brothers are disrespecting their mothers and fathers. The brothers are living off of the welfare. The brothers are staying in the street all night, smoking hubbly bubbly, watching Al Jazeera, okay, and sitting on the computer and Facebook, and then they get some kind of epiphany in the middle of the night, they want to go somewhere and die. No, they're already dead. 
They're already socially dysfunctional. It is very sad that a young man, he wants to kill somebody before he has brought anything to life. He did not contribute to any institution. Maybe he did not even finish high school. He did not develop any kind of intellectual resource. But he's angry, he's frustrated, and he wants to kill somebody. Well, he needs to kill his nafs. Because I don't think that it's a matter of courage or integrity that he's going somewhere to fight and die. He's going somewhere and he's going to send a picture back and tell the brothers, yo man, check me out, man. I'm out here doing jihad, yo. So, I would suggest that the young men prepare themselves for marriage. And that means get a job, yo. Brothers be talking about, I, be, I'm, I'm, I have a difficult time, Shake, What can I do, man? You know, all these sisters, man, they want too much money. You know, what can I do, Shake? I, I can't find the right sister. Man, you don't have no job, man. You are socially irresponsible, man. Who wants to give their daughter to a bum? Man, go to school. Get a degree. Open a business. Be a man. Take care of your mother and your sisters and your daughters and your wives. After you take care of that responsibility and you want to go somewhere, the next thing is see if you can throw back the sheets in the morning for the Fajr prayer because if you can't beat the sheets you don't need to be going out to beat no kafirs and Allah knows best Jazakallah khair Sheikh do we have any questions from the sisters? yes please how can the sisters contribute to the modern society? Uh, sisters listen you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions laysa dhakra kal untha you know the the, the men and the women, they're not exactly the same. This means the way they achieve things is not exactly the same. You know, their anatomies are not exactly the same. And even their thinking patterns are not exactly the same. You know, women have a degree of more emotionality than men because it's a degree of protection for them. Women are, tend to be more jealous than the men because it's a source of protection for them. It's an asset for them. So the women is not the same as the men. But... In regards to earning the rewards of Allah and involving yourself in the issues of the society, you have equal access to that, but just in a different way to protect and insulate yourself. So the sisters should engage in human services. The sisters should engage in things that will benefit women and their family. The sisters should become engineers, researchers, the sisters should become supportive of government and take the jobs that are supportive and not the ones that force them to go out. But women have as much right as men to help to reform the society. And we can see in the modern world today that we have five or six women who are six or seven of the most influential human beings on the earth today. I talked about that yesterday. The fact that they happen to be non-Muslims doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means, and just, I was listening yesterday. The first African leader, the first woman African leader is in Mali. Malawi, I mean. Malawi. The president of Malawi is a woman. And when you hear her speak, how she wants to reform her country, you never heard an African from Malawi before her speaking like that. I don't say she should be the president. I mean, I don't know where the men are. So sisters, protect yourself. And may Allah bless you for your aspirations. But protect yourself and insulate yourself before you step out and take the roles, inshallah, uh, that you can do within your capacity. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Yes. You're talking about social responsibility. What does that mean in practical form and how can we inform that and help? Uh, social responsibility, sister, starts from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-rijalu kuwamuna ala nisa. You see, it's very simple. The men, they are the maintainers and the protectors and the guardians of women and children because that is their responsibility based upon the strength 
okay, and the resources Allah He gave to them. That's social responsibility. And before we get real sophisticated, the men need to take care of their social responsibility. And the social responsibility of the sisters, okay, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, all of you is a shepherd. All of you is a shepherd and a guardian. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds all of you responsible for what is under your care. The ruler, you see, is responsible for the people under his authority. The man is responsible for his wife and his children and his family members. And the woman, she's responsible for her husband's property in his absence and herself and her children. And Allah will hold all of you responsible for that. So social responsibility begins there. It moves on as a ripple out into the society, into the development of resources and institutions and participating in the society like that. As we saw in Malaysia, I mean, as we saw in Indonesia, Muslims went to Indonesia and because they were socially responsible, they were embraced and they were given the opportunity and eventually the Muslims outnumbered everybody because of the resources. So this is my response to what social responsibility means and Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair Sheikh. Do we have any more questions from the sisters? Yeah, um, you have personally criticized some of the leaders who keep saying haram, haram and haram and they don't give any solutions. Now, what are some of the solutions you personally would give to achieve a social reform, reform or movement, especially in the context of a European society? Okay, uh, sister, all due respects, that requires a workshop. To answer that requires a workshop. It is not just a question, an answer. The other thing is that uh, I don't want somebody to get the impression that I'm casting aspersions upon the leadership. I'm not. It's just that leaders are more responsible in front of Allah than the followers. It is the duty of a leader not just to point out what is haram and what is wrong, but it's the duty of the leader to point out the defects, okay, and to help fix it. To point out the problems and to find the solutions. To see where the suffering of the people is and to help relieve that. So that's in front of Allah. The leaders are more responsible in front of Allah. So I only spoke about the leaders in that capacity. But, uh, but not to cast any kind of aspersion. And I also mentioned that it's the duty of the leaders to come together with other leaders. So they can have tawasaw. Wa ta'awan. They can come together and they can consult each other and support each other and, uh, and collaborate together and cooperate together to deal with these problems. So the leaders need to have intermittent, that means periodical, workshops, workshops, not lectures. And then we, we should start integrating into this here lecture model, workshops. Like you have a lecture and then you have 45 minutes of workshops with all that space that's on the other side over here. It would be beautiful to have a one hour lecture. And then after that, for the people to split up and into 10 different workshops and then come back from those workshops with the result of those workshops and then have another lecture and then workshops. And then at the end, summarize what we got from the lectures and summarize what we got from the workshops. This is a model that's being done all over the European world inside the universities and creating think tanks. So that's part of the social responsibility model that I'm speaking about. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair Sheikh has a new question. Should we call to remove democracy in Norway and implement Sharia here or should we begin with the Muslim countries? How would the Prophet This do? is just silly. I mean, people just think, man, like it's come kind of labels, you know, remove democracy, install the, uh, uh, Sharia. What kind of stupidness are you talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could not have given the Prophet sallam, the ability to establish Sharia in Mecca. Allah, he could not do that. He didn't do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he instilled, he cultivated iman in the people. Then after that, he moved the Prophet ﷺ to another place under his, move him to another place that he could develop his influence. And over a period of time, the Prophet ﷺ consolidated his influence. Where? In a place that came under his feet. 
He could not establish jihad until he had domination of the land. Muslims, they want to eat from the welfare and establish Sharia. I mean, what you, hey brothers, what are you smoking? Let's just leave all that kalam al fadi. Let's leave all that rhetoric to the side, okay, and, and stand up and be men. Evaluate yourself. What you have computed, compu uh, what you have contributed, what have you accomplished, what have you invested, what kind of man are you really? Are you taking care of your wife and your daughters and your sisters and your mothers and your aunties? Are you in obedience to an Amir? Do you belong to a community, an organized body of Muslims? You just want to be talking, just taking words and putting them in your pocket and then popping them out like rabbits. Islam is not established shake and bake. Those are pancakes. That's not Islam. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We have a question. How can we get a wife when we can't talk to them? I don't know, Aki. I can't tell the brothers. I never had a problem getting a wife. And I'm not talking with sisters. You know, it's not like I'm out hunting. I think that when men stand up as real men, when a sister knows that a brother is educated, when a sister knows that a brother is resourceful, when a sister knows that a brother, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's mutawwe, he's mutadayin, multazim, when a sister knows that a brother is very sincere to his religion and towards Allah, when he's respectful to his family, those sisters will be asking for him. But when you got to be hunting for sisters, then there's something wrong maybe with the hunter. The same thing goes for the sisters. When sisters are resourceful, not just beautiful, not just attractive, you know, not just fat, P-H-A-T. Y'all know that, right? That's a different kind of fat. P-H-A-T, pretty, hot, and tempting. <laughs> you know, that's, that's Ebonics. You know, when the sisters are more than just that, when they are smart, resourceful, Multazima, Mutadayina. When the sisters, they are Mutakiya. When the sisters, they fear Allah. They are good women. Learn from their mothers. They know how to take care of a man and a family. They know how to take care of themselves. Don't worry. Brothers will be jumping over each other with proposals. But if you're not like that, that's probably why you're having problems and issues because you're socially dysfunctional. Brothers and sisters, improve yourselves. Take a good look at yourselves and prepare yourselves for marriage. Uh, there is a, uh, and I'd like to talk to Brother uh, um, Fahad and his group uh, about maybe we can have a major workshop called Nia to Nikah. Nia to Nikah, because that's where we get hung up at. We don't have the right Nia leading towards Nikah. We have desires leading towards relationships. So they're not working out. Even the brothers who get married, the marriages are not lasting. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the scholars, the students of knowledge, that they will gather the Muslims together, the young Muslims together, and deal with this issue because we are losing our brothers and sisters out the back door. And y'all know what the back door is. And Allah, he knows best. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Do we have a question from sisters? How can you fight um, al nafs, um, the lower nafs? Alhamdulillah, sister, look. Fadakir inna fa'aj dhikra. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uh, gave us many ways, sister, to battle our nafs. Most of the exercises that Allah gave us, the spiritual exercise that He gave to us, has to do with battling our nafs. You know, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much and often. That's one. Most of the masajids that you go to in the front wall or in the lobby, there's a poster that has the adhkar that you should recite 
before and after the prayers. My suggestion is memorize those and use them all the time. Wake up for the Fajr prayer. Know where your food and your, your, know where your money comes from. Lower your gaze and guard your modesty. Send salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu often. Hmm? Be just in your behavior. Call upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the middle of the night. Read Quran as much as you can and that much of it that you have memorized, read it regularly. These are the things I think. Give sadaqah as much as you can. Say, Na'udhu Billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli dhanbin wa atubu ilayk. Say those kinds of things on a regular basis and say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Say those kinds of things regularly and do good actions and you will, inshallah, subordinate your nafs. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We have one minute left, so if there's one question, you need to state it in 10 seconds. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I heard you earlier speaking about we should be interacting to the societies, and uh, but sometimes the problem comes actually from the society or from the government. Uh, for example, uh, not long ago, there was a documentary here in Norway about uh, sisters who were going to the university and they were not uh, allowed to use niqab, for example, yes. in the university. Yes. That's one issue. The other issue is the, that the brothers, most of them, sometimes they don't work. It's just because they are not uh, able to get or to be hired, you know, by the yes, uh, by the government or whoever, you know, the work uh, employees. So, what can we do about these kind of problems? Right it's a good question. Uh, regarding the um, the slanders of the society using the media, um, we have been battling with them for the last 12 to 15 years. The problem is, in most cases, we are reacting. We don't need to react, we need to respond. And that's what the Purpose of Life Foundation has been engaged in. This is what the Purpose Media Group is doing. Uh, we are engaging into the field of media so that our next door neighbor is NBC, ABC, Microsoft, Oracle, Amazon, eBay. Those are our next door neighbors, why? Because when they say something using the platform of media, we are going to also respond with the platform of media. But it costs money. It's not dua, it's money. So we have to battle with them using the resources that they're using against us. This is one. Number two, um, our Prophet Sallallahu he said, and uh, Sheikh uh, Haddad is here, you know, one of our senior scholars, uh, he can uh, verify this better than I can. But as I recall, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that nine-tenths of the risk of Bani Adam, nine-tenths of the risk of Bani Adam is in tijara. Is that correct, Sheikh? Tijara. That means nine-tenths of the risk for the brothers is in tijara, doing business for themselves. We don't have to stand on the line asking somebody for a job. We're wasting our time because even after you get the job, you're going to be subordinate for the rest of your life. You're going to ask the boss, boss, can I make Juma? Boss, can I go make Hajj? Boss, is it all right for me to grow my lihya? Boss, no. Do business along with whatever else you do. Learn how to do business. And our sisters learn how to do business because one of the biggest businesses in the world is the business of social media. Our sisters can control that business from their homes because sisters, they like to talk. So if our brothers and our sisters concentrate on doing business, using multimedia, doing business and trade, they don't have to ask anybody about what they want to wear, about where they want to go. They don't have to ask anybody about a job. They don't have to worry about have, taking care of a wife. And eventually, if Muslims do business, their character is going to become known through their business. 
And this is how, this is how Indonesia as a country was overwhelmed by the Muslims through doing business. And Allah, he knows the best. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you so very much. I want to thank the elders, uh, the students of knowledge, uh, the leaders of the Muslims. Uh, I want to thank the sisters, uh, the mothers, the daughters, uh, the wives. Uh, I want to thank all of them for coming out with their children in some cases. I want to thank the brothers who did the hard work to, to coordinate uh, this, uh, uh, this set of uh, uh, lectures. Uh, especially, I want to commend uh, my young brother, Fahad. I have been watching him, uh, you know, uh, over the years. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if you had 10 or 20 hard workers uh, like this young brother, and uh, I don't want to say it in his face, but we should be grateful and thank the brother and his colleagues for the kind of work that they're doing. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you who came and paid for a ticket. Good. But don't think that the ticket entitles you to anything more than just what you have enjoyed. Before you leave, if they have some kind of fundraiser so that they can buy a place like this here and not have to rent a place like this, you should give them whatever you have so that one day, Muslims in Norway, Muslims in Sweden, Muslims in the uh, Netherlands, they will have halls like this that belong to the Muslims where they can pray and also where they can say. And we ask Allah SWT to forgive all of us for our shortcomings. We say, Subhanakallahumma bihamdik wa nashadu wa na ilaha illa ant wa nastaghfiruk wa natubu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh.